OK? All right, let's uh, continue. <clears throat> so I really, I do encourage you to actually read this, uh, this, these beautiful papers from, you know, the, from the archives. Um, but because, you know, they're every, you know, you go back in time, you read these old papers, and they're, people are very clever. And there's a lot of smart, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. And this paper is full of clever things, like the fact that they didn't write the recursion, the eight particle amplitude in a form that was obtained by recursion seems kind of incredible. It's because they knew what they wanted. They wanted, to, they wanted to see something like manifest cyclicity, so they kind of found some seeds and then kind of added them up and found some identities. And you know, this is kind of the way things work. And similarly, for the six particle amplitude, they didn't write it as this weird function plus this weird function plus this weird function, probably because they evaluated these three functions. They knew what they were as functions of spinners, lambdas and lambda tildes. And they knew that even though these are very different looking pictures, they're basically the same function, OK? And let me show you what I mean by that. Um, <clears throat> so again, they don't look, they're not the same, they're, they're, they're manifestly not the same graphs, but they're very closely related. And in fact, the way they're closely related is that as a super function, as a function of the kinematical data, this thing is the same as this one, just where you rotate all the indices by two. And this is the same as the first one if you rotate all the indices by four. And so it's really, it's not exactly a six-fold cyclic sum. It's something plus rotate by two plus rotate by four. Um, and it, so it looks actually way more compact. And in the formula, they wrote one plus rotate by two plus rotate by four, one single function, which is what they did in the original paper. And to see that actually takes a lot of time. And, this, and I encourage you to do, well, I guess I'll walk you through the whole thing. But I've been very careful and, let's say, it took a lot of work to make it this, as concise, to, make, to allow me to walk you through this in detail. But I want, to, I want to now show you that these diagrams are actually related to each other by these sequences of moves. And I arranged things I, you know, beforehand in a very sneaky way so that this was almost as simple as it could possibly be, which is still requires a series of moves. And to show that these diagrams are all the same, you can do it in, a, in the following sequence of things. You, you take this diagram and you do the merge, unmerge, you do the tree move on this thing. So you rewrite this thing the other way around. And you rewrite this side the other way around. Okay? You're not done yet with this diagram, but that'll get you started. And on this diagram, you do the same kind of tree relation on this edge and you do the same tree relation on this edge. OK, so that's your start. And for the sake of this, of seeing that these are basically the same functions or the same diagrams by these equivalence relations, it's useful to just kind of ignore all the labels and just you know, keep track of where 6 is. You know, this one starred. So let's, we just put a star here. Um, come on. So there's one marked leg, and then it's cyclic around there. And that's leg 6 is starred. OK, now if you do this move here, and you do this pair of moves here, and you do that pair of moves here, you're not exactly done yet, but you're close. And this is where I kind of cheated before the lecture. It probably isn't worth copying all these figures, but I did draw this beforehand. OK? It's really hard to do these moves on the board, because you have to erase a lot, and you have to redraw a lot of things. OK, anyway, you do that move there, and have Hope you can convince yourself that this graph is identical to that graph if you just do the move on the circled uh, edge. Okay, so you just redraw this thing. This thing becomes a pentagon. That thing becomes a square. Okay, and you get that picture up there. Similarly, if you do that there, these when you do the move, you you know you lower the edge count on one of the faces and you increase it on the other. So this thing becomes a hexagon becomes a pentagon, pentagon, and then becomes a square pentagon. So you did these moves. So this, the circled operation brings you up to the upper board. And similarly here. OK. Now, the first diagram and the last diagram are actually the same. But the middle diagram is not yet the same. Can anybody tell me what's, what is different about diagram? Oh my god, it's not done yet. So what is different about diagram two? Of what? 
Okay. Uh, yes, the box. So this one, I mean, it's, it's a flip of the other ones, but we're not talking about, we're not doing flips here. So in order to get to this, to that, we need to do the square move. So we can show these equivalents with a single square move. OK, and now the diagrams are actually all the same. And you can see that the first diagram has this marked point, which is corresponds, it's six in this one, it's two in this one. OK, and over here, that one is called four, you know, this marked point. So you can see that you take this diagram and the left one has this thing marked, the right one has this thing marked. So they're all rotations of each other. And that's pretty incredible. It allows you to write this whole answer in terms of one particular function, um, which I'm going to, maybe, maybe it's worth quoting. I'll bring, I'll tell you what, I'll write it very explicitly at the very end. If we have time. But I want to now derive what the function is, um, um, kind of a, a very powerful but pretty indirect way. OK. So this equivalence relation among diagrams actually is a very, very large equivalence class. If you look at the space, so these moves do not change the number of faces. So you have a, a graph with a certain number of loops, and this just relates them to each other. But the number of graphs, um, these trivalent graphs with a fixed number of multiplicity, grows extremely rapidly. And we know that these moves, so, so we relate to very different looking graphs. I mean, you wouldn't look at this graph and think of it as a cyclic rotation of this graph. Right? And so we'd like a way of characterizing these functions. Um, I'll bring up the upper one if you wanted to copy it down. We'd like a way of characterizing these on-shell functions in a way that's invariant and hopefully uh, faithful to, to these, uh, what am I doing? Um, faithful to the, to, the, to the function. And it turns out this is where, you know, physicists stopped drawing these pictures, I think in part because they were clearly redundant. There were these massive equivalence classes of diagrams, and it was just a lot of work to draw the diagrams. I mean, just think doing this in LaTeX, it kind of takes a while. It's, uh, you know, eventually you just kind of get some shorthand and you stop doing it. I mean, the, the proof by, with Brito, Kachazo, Fenga, and Witten the subsequent proof of these recursion relations doesn't have any diagrams in it at all. It's just about Cauchy's theorem. It's a very simple kind of proof. Um, and I think reflecting the fact that diagrams are hard to draw and they're, they're clearly redundant in a way that's kind of annoying. And it's a shame that we stopped drawing them because like I said, around the time that these diagrams were drawn by physicists, they were also being drawn by mathematicians um, who knew from years before at least one invariant of these diagrams that was, that. Uh, one characteristic of these diagrams would be left invariant under these moves. And this is a permutation obtained in the following way. So it's called a path permutation. And for this, I'm going to erase these pictures, although they are very pretty. Um, okay. I'm just going to leave up this middle one. So we have, we have planar graphs with two different colored vertices. Um, with two different colored vertices. Um, and we would like to characterize them in some way that at least is left invariant under the moves. Whether it's faithful, meaning that it completely characterizes the function, is a much higher uh, request. But at the moment, we just like to characterize it in a way that's left invariant. And this, and it turns out that the easiest way to do this is a permutation. So it's called a path permutation. So you imagine, so you have the, the diagram, it's planar, so it's imagine drawn on the plane with a boundary disk. And you start at, that, at leg A. A. A goes to sigma of A. Um, uh, where um, obtained in the following way. You turn left, you start, start at A. Um, start at leg A. Um, go inward and turn left 
at uh, any empty vertex and turn right at shaded vertices. Okay, it's pretty easy to see that, that this will bring you outside of the graph and will land you on some external leg somewhere. What is much more interesting is that this permutation, this path that's defined by going through the graph by zigzagging around, sometimes called zigzag paths, is left invariant under these moves. And we can see that pretty easily. I'm not going to draw all the paths, but if you start at this leg, for example, and you go into the graph, you turn left at an empty vertex, and you turn right at a shaded vertex, and you turn left at an empty vertex. So we have this kind of path here, and it brings this leg to that leg. And similarly, if we take this one, we turn right at a shaded vertex, and we turn left at an empty that, and we still have this leg goes to that leg, this leg goes to that leg. Um, so, and I will, the other three paths I will leave as an exercise. So these moves leave, are left, this permutation is left invariant under the first move. Under the second move, it's much easier. You turn left at every white empty vertex. That goes like that. This goes like that. It's very easy to see that the paths just kind of ignore these trees of same colored vertices. Um, OK, so this permutation now is uh, left invariant. Um, ah, OK. Well, I don't know if there are any colors that are, does anybody remember a color from previous lecture that was visible, that wasn't white? I'm going to need to, well, I'll try orange. Yeah. Um, well, I've got a few to choose from, but I think like green looks like a bad bet. Um, okay, well, let's, let's associate this thing with the permutation. So this thing, we have one goes somewhere, two goes somewhere, three goes somewhere, four goes somewhere, five somewhere, six goes somewhere. <clears throat> and I want to erase these. Okay. We're going to try orange. I think there was a red somewhere, too. Ah, but it's the wrong kind of chalk. I'm, I'm picky. Okay, let's just let's try this orange. Hopefully, orange works. So, one. So one. You you start at leg one, and you go into the graph, and you turn left at an empty vertex. So you turn left, and now you turn left again because this is an empty vertex. But you turn right here. This is why it's sometimes called a zigzag because whenever you have a, a an empty to shaded vertex edge, you cross. You change directions. Um, this is, Lauren Williams calls this the rules of the road. It's, uh, you, you know, whether you turn right at the, at the intersection or turn left. Okay, so it goes here. This is one goes to three. I'll write that in white. Um, Okay, two, we turn right at a shaded vertex. We turn left at an empty vertex. Turn right at a shaded vertex. Turn left at an empty vertex. Right, left, and to five. If you're gonna play this game at home, it's kind of worth remembering that from this little picture, that a little box like this always just crosses diagonally across it. So you kind of know that two goes in here, goes to five. Um, however it crosses the box, it always kind of goes opposite corners. So two goes to five. Three. Three comes in, it turns uh, left at the, the empty vertex, right at the shaded vertex, left, left again, then right, three goes to six. Four, four goes in and it turns 
uh, right, left, right, goes down here, goes this way, to one. Five, same kind of thing as two. So we just know that we're gonna zigzag around here, then we're going to cross this diagram. Three, five goes to two. And six has only one option, so if we did everything correct, we turn right, turn right, zigzag around, goes to four. So we have a permutation here. Oh, so the, 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 the 20 page proof, I was, page page. I was mentioning this before, the, 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 or in the break here. Um, there's a theorem which uh, I would have, well, I'm just going to tell you it's true, and you're going to believe me, but it takes, it's surprisingly not easy to prove, but it was originally proved by Posnikov, which is that if two graphs with the same number, no, two reduced, I didn't know, there's a qualification here that I, for legalistic reason, I'm going to say reduced graphs that have the same permutation labels are related by moves. So any two graphs, if you have two graphs, so, so this is faithful. If you have a graph one and graph two and they are labeled by the same permutation, they are related by a sequence of moves. And the proof of that takes 20 pages or so. It's pretty difficult um, or surprisingly difficult. Um, but let's just believe that's true and that's what is going to be faithful. So this reduced little caveat here um, is related, well, every diagram that comes out of recursion um, that we're drawing, once we threw out the things that vanished, is reduced. So it applies to this, which means that any representative graph with this permutation is equivalent by moves to any other graph related by, um, labeled by this permutation. And that is a very powerful thing. It is going to allow us to erase the graph um, in the following way. So that's what I want to show you now, is how we can use that fact to start from this permutation label and derive both a formula for this thing and also a representative graph if you'd so desired. So that instead of emailing your friend uh, this picture or writing this picture inside of a uh, paper which takes a while to draw, you could just say the function labeled by this and you'd be done. And indeed, this is the deep down, the, the, the way that the recursion relations are implemented. So we can see that actually here, right? So at if you look at this recursion relation, this becomes a combinatorial thing about permutation labels very quickly. You look at how one comes in, so one goes over here, turns, um, one goes left and right, and it goes in somewhere and it goes out somewhere, and whatever comes this way goes this way, and you glue the permutations on the left and on the right, and I will leave it as kind of an exercise. Whatever come, came out here goes over to N, and what came out here goes over to one. Um, so knowing the permutation on the left and the permutation on the right, you immediately get a permutation for the bridge. And this allows you to reduce all of this recursion relations just to a combinatorial statement, making it incredibly efficient. Um, this is actually not the way we're going to do it um, on Friday, in part, well, for reasons that we'll, I'll get to. We're going, to, we're going to use a different formula, formulation. But this is, I mean, the main reason why we're not going to do it on Friday is because it requires a lot more technology um, to, uh, it's not something I could code in real time in front of people, um, uh, faith, you know, faithfully. So instead, I'm, I'm going to do something a little more concrete. So the way to, to, to erase the graphs is to notice, is to go back to this bridge operation, which doesn't now have anything to do with recursion per se. It's really, remember that we, if we had a single, uh, some diagram like this with A and B um, here, and we added a bridge, um, maybe I'll erase this F, so some diagram goes to some diagram where we added this bridge, A and B, lots of legs, and thereby define a new diagram 
Um, I guess I can't resist putting that thing in there. Okay. So some new diagram with the bridge. So this is including the big thing. That this, as a function, re related f, f prime to f in a very simple way. Right, so I'll, I'll put the f's back in here. So, um, so that we had f prime was, was d alpha over alpha, where alpha was, this, was some parameter associated with this new momentum. Um, f evaluated on a prime as a function of alpha and b prime as a function of alpha, where a and b prime are the new momentum flowing through here. So a prime is a plus that, mom minus that momentum, and b is plus that momentum. Anyway, so it's a shifted function. And we also saw that in terms of the Grassmannian representation, this was actually very simple. This just took um, C prime was the same as C, same as the matrix C, um, except that uh, column C, so column B, the Bth column um, of the new matrix prime, so CB prime is CB of the original matrix plus alpha times the column of the original matrix. So, so as this is in terms of solutions to things. This is just as in terms of this Grassmannian representation, all you do is you just shift some columns around. Um, very simple. OK, now this is kind of cute, and it allowed us to, to see how to get the recursion relations by adding a bridge to some tree amplitude and then using recursion and using Cochise theorem. But it becomes a pretty powerful combinatorial tool when we realize we can actually read it in the other direction. Um, uh, that we can take a function and we can remove a bridge and we can get to a simpler function. This f has fewer internal degrees of freedom. It's more constrained. It's simpler. And in fact, if you can eventually delete it till you get to something basically empty, we'll see how that works in practice. Okay. And the reason why this, and the reason why this has something to do with this combinatorics is because this acts very nicely on the, uh, adding bridges is a very simple operation in terms of permutations. So if you look at, you know, you originally had some path that started at leg A and went out to sigma of A, okay? And in this picture here, we have some path and what went, went the image of A now, and we had some path that went B to sigma of B, sigma of B. And now goes to sigma, this is sigma of A, sigma prime of A, which is sigma of B. And the path from B goes out and it goes to wherever A used to go. So sigma prime of B, which is sigma of A. Which is to say that the permutation labeling F prime is the same as the permutation labeling F except for up to a permutation, up to a transposition. So that means it's the label on the graph of F prime is a transposition, which I'm going to denote this kind of parens here, um, between the images of leg A and the leg B with uh, sigma, which is equivalent to transposition squared of one. So that sigma is a transposition of the images of sigma prime. Um, there. So they're related by transposing the images of, of two legs. By the way, if you change the coloring of this bridge, so if you made it shaded empty, it wouldn't transpose the images of A and B. It would transpose the pre-images of A and B. So you can do that too. I'm just going to choose this particular bridge choice for, I don't know, uh, so that I can fix my conventions and walk you through something. So. Um, Now, there's a, now, because both adding a bridge and removing a bridge transposes the images, there's something, there's a little bit that I'm not, that I don't have time to tell you about, about whether, about reducing, about actually knowing whether this permutation or that permutation is simpler, labels a simpler function. So which permutations um, do this? But I will tell you a rule, which is not the only available choice, but it is a, one that will work. So, th but let me go back. The, um, the idea here is that knowing that 
This function labeled by this permutation is related to a simpler function labeled by a simpler permutation or a, a, a different permutation, allows you to recursively connect this down to something trivial. Um, iteratively connect it, not recursively, iteratively connect it. And, th and the basic idea is that you keep decomposing this permutation until you get to the identity. And there are many ways of getting from a permutation and writing a permutation as a sequence of transpositions on the identity. There's a beautiful, if you're a combinatorist, there's a big, long, very interesting story about this. Um, and for the sake of time and just concreteness, I'm going to tell you exactly one pathway that will get you from any permutation down to the identity. Um, and it is one choice among many, many choices, but it is proof, it will suffice, it works every case, and it will always give you a representative. And it always has this property that it's walking you down, it bringing you simpler. So I'm not proving that, but you can believe me. So I'm call, it's called the lex min, or the lexicographic um, bridge construction. The basic steps are very simple. One, um, if sigma is identity stop, okay, two, um, else write sigma as um, a, B, sigma prime, um, where A and B are the first, the lex first. So starting at leg one, the first such that um, sigma of A is less than sigma of B. So this is like winding up the permutation. If the images of A and B are ordered, like in this picture, like so B goes to something and, and A goes to something bigger than A, then you wrap it. Okay, so you make it less ordered. You keep going like this. Um, uh, uh, and then there's an important little thing here, which is that allowing for, allowing A and B to be separated by uh, legs which go to themselves, which map to themselves. The reason for this is that if we want to talk about only allowing for planar graphs, it's not strictly necessary that legs A and B are adjacent to each other. It could have been that you had some like hanging stuff over here. You know, you could have had some, some hanging things on this and the whole graph still would have been planar. And so it's just important and if you think about the path permutations, if you have a hanging leg, it sends it back to itself. Anyway, we'll see how this works in practice. Um, let me just walk you through it. In one instance, we'll construct a representative of that particular graph there. Um, let's see how that works. So we're going to find a formula for the function. Yeah. Yep. Um, sorry, can you ask that again? So, so these three diagrams you have uh, are each one representative of one permutation. Um, so are these three different permutations unique or can you exchange them as well? Ah, that's a good question. So, um, so the first they're not the same, they were rotations of each other. So they were close, but they, their exceedances were rotated. Um, the, uh, there, there is exactly one other uh, three-term formula you can get. So it turns out that if you do BCFW and all the conceivable choices for six particles and three, k equals three, you'll find uh, only two different formulas. And they're actually related by cyclicity. So it's the rotations by one you don't find in this formula. 
And they're very different functions. It's kind of surprising. I mean, not very different. They're rotations by one. But so proving that it's actually cyclic under rotation by one requires this equality between formula one and formula two. OK. So the first step in this construction is a little bit of technical thing. And I probably should have clarified it as part of this definition. But in order for this to be correct without any further caveats, I need to talk about decorated permutations, which is just a completely conventional silly thing. But it is very useful um, because it's going to allow me to not modify that statement. And it is a convention that we always say that every leg goes to something bigger than itself. OK? So strictly speaking, this is not a permutation. It's called a decorated permutation. Because instead of saying that 4 goes to 1, I'm going to say that it has to go to something bigger than 4. And in particular, I'm going to write 7, which is bigger than, bigger than 4. So 7 mod 6 is 1. And similarly, 5 goes to 2. Instead of writing that, I'm going to say that 5 goes to 8. And 6 goes to 10. So going to itself can be going to itself directly or going to itself plus n. There's going to be a distinction. And this is all related to this. The, uh, um, for a general permutation, if nothing maps to itself, there's no caveat to care about. This is just a convention. It becomes meaningful and useful on a technical level when you get down to the bottom where you have permutations that map to themselves a lot. So let's see how this works. So we have this original permutation, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1 goes to 3. 2 goes to 5. Um, 3 goes to 6. 4 goes to 7. 5 goes to 8. And 6 goes to 10. Here's our original permutation, um, sigma. And I guess. Uh, <laughs> Instead of denoting primes and things, I'm going to label the sigma by the dimension, by, the D, by D as defined in the previous lecture. Um, said another way, I'm going to define it with hindsight from where I end up on. So I'm going to call this sigma of 8 for reasons that will become clear. I could call it 0, but it's better to call it this one. OK, just allow me to call it sigma 8. And I'm going to write sigma 8 is, I want to write sigma 8 is some transposition uh, tau 1 on sigma 7, which is tau 1, tau 2 on sigma 6, et cetera. And I want to decompose it down to something where sigma 0 is the decoration of the identity. So here's my taus. This rule tells you which one to pick. Um, so our first transposition, what do we do? We pick the first pair of legs, A and B, such that their images are ordered. Can somebody tell me what the first pair whose images are ordered? One and two. Good. So let me go to, back to my other colored chalk. So we're going to transpose. Now one goes to five and two goes to three. And the rest stays the same. I'm going to quickly stop writing these things, because again, the transpositions only act on one column. So the first transposition is between legs one and two. And then what's the next transposition we can do? So on this permutation now, which is sigma seven, which, which is the first pair that's ordered? Two, three. So write two, three, six, three. And now notice something is already special has already happened. Three has gone to itself. It's locked. Leave it alone from now on. And there's still a 5 here and 7. Nothing else has changed, so 10. Again, I'm going to stop writing the things that just go up here. So now what do we have? What is the next one? This is sigma 6. 1, 2 again. So we get 6, 5. Then I'll give you a hint. There's a 7 over here. Two, four, good. So seven. We, have a, we still have a six here. So we can do a one, two again. And now one is mapping to itself plus six. So it's, a, it's locked in now. But we have a six. 
So there's a little secret three here, which is just continuing down forever. Um, we have a five. We have eight. We have 10. So what's the next one? Four, five, good. Eight, five, five is now locked. Five goes to itself. So we're gonna ignore it from now on. What's the, the next one? Uh, two, four. I, the, the missing column is a little harder to, to see. So, so now eight and six. And two goes to eight is going to itself. Um, and then we only have one left, which is four, six. And we land on this permutation, which is one goes to seven. Um, I'm gonna, my coloring now means something else. Seven, go, two goes to eight, three goes to three, four goes to 10, and uh, five goes to five, and six goes to six. Okay, so the algorithm tells us we stop. This is sigma zero. Okay, <clears throat> now the, um, this, this algorithm, we've just, I've given you one concrete representative of how to take a random permutation, decorated permutation, and construct it as a sequence of transpositions on the identity. This, by the logic we just, we talked about, by the logic of a few minutes ago, also gives us a representative diagram that has this path permutation, or Path permutation as its path permutation. So the idea there is we start, we write one, two, three, four, five, six. We have them on the outside of some graph. You know, so there's like some big boundary here. And the diagram that we have, we don't know anything about it, but we do know that one goes in and comes back out at three. But we know that whatever diagram we had, it's just a bridge between legs one and two on something simpler. And then it's a bridge between legs two and three and then it's a bridge between legs one and two, and then a bridge between legs two and four, uh, sorry, one, sorry, one, two, two, three, one, two, two, four, okay. Uh, then a one, two again. Four, five, I'm gonna draw it lower just because it's, well, they're ordered. Then a two, four again, or not two, uh, yeah, again. So again, it's always empty to shaded as we're going downward. And then four goes to six. And I should point out that at this, from this moment onward, I'm, I mean, at this point, it's worth pointing out that I'm allowing for bivalent vertices. And the rule is that this is equal to that and this is equal to that. So bivalent vertices don't add anything, so you can just go ahead and delete this if you'd like and make that a curved arrow and whatnot. Okay, so I will leave it as an exercise, but if I didn't screw up the, the, the rule, uh, this is, uh, it's pretty easy to see that one comes in here. Well, we can check one at least. Let's see that one goes in, so it turns, um, turns right at the white vertex, at the empty vertex, turns left of the shaded, uh, uh, sorry, I said, I got my left and right screwed up. Anyway, it goes here and it goes out to three. Okay, so this graph is not the same as that graph. It's a very different looking graph. And if you believe that theorem I quoted by Posnikov, um, it is related by moves to that. I'll leave that as an exercise to show as well. So that's a, I can't remember how many steps it is, but it's not a simple exercise. Okay, but this also gives us not just a representative graph, but it gives us a representative function. Why? Because we know that the function we care about, so this function that's labeled by sigma of eight, um, is a bridge. And this is where I'm gonna start calling, I'm gonna label the variables attached to these bridges. So, so this is why I'm going eight downward. I'm gonna say this is alpha eight, this is alpha seven, alpha six, alpha five, 
alpha 4, alpha 3, 2, alpha 1. So this is d alpha 8 over alpha 8 times some shifted thing of uh, labeled by sigma 7 is just d alpha 1 wedged with d alpha 8 over alpha 8 on some f0, f sigma 0. OK. And the claim is that this is supposed to be simple. What is sigma 0? Or sigma 0 is this identity permutation here. And what is it as a graph? It's a graph without any bridges. So sigma 0, uh, so f sigma 0 corresponds to the following fairly trivial on-shell diagram. We have 1 coming in. You delete all the bridges. And it ends at a hanging edge. 2 goes in, goes to itself. So 1, 2, 3 goes in and ends on a shaded vertex. Strictly speaking, this needs more technology than what I've given you, but it's not hard. You can, everything is pretty self-contained in this lecture, um, meaning that we're going to allow for the graphs with empty, with, with hanging, with monovalent vertices. Right. So this is the on-shell diagram for the bottom. And then we have this sequence of bridges that walks us up to the, to the one that we care about. And what is this function? It's something that we probably don't have a lot of intuition about, but on an operational level, it's pretty simple. If all the momenta into the diagram end by themselves, this corresponds to a con maximal constraint. It's something with d hat equal to 2n minus 4. It's a, it's a or minus 2n minus 4. It's a, a bunch of delta functions. In fact, it's 2n uh, delta functions. It just tells you that every momentum flowing into this diagram is 0. So f sigma 0 is a very simple on-shell function. It is just delta, it, the difference between the coloring, and this is why this decorated permutation business is nice to, uh, a nice convention to keep around, is because when you end up, it tells you it differentiates between things that went to themselves plus n and things that went to themselves directly. And that corresponds to the coloring of these vertices in this bottom picture. And the coloring tells you whether the lambda is 0 or the lambda tilde is 0. And the rule is an empty vertex sets lambda tilde to 0. So lambda tilde 1 is 0. Lambda tilde of 2 is 0. Delta lambda 4, lambda tilde of 4 is 0, because those are the white ones. And everything that goes to a shaded vertex, the lambdas vanish. So lambda of particle 3 is 0. Lambda of particle 5 is 0, and lambda of particle 6 is 0. And because we're talking about supersymmetry, I might as well point out that this only has a single component. There's only one component for this function, and it, the full superfunction is just eta 1 bar to the fourth, eta 2 bar to the fourth, eta 4 bar to the fourth. All other components of this superfunction are 0. So it's a very easy fermionic delta function. Now there's a nicer way of writing this. And to write that, I'm going to, this is, okay. I'm kind of running out of time, but I will just finish up by, by writing this. The, So this set of delta functions, there's an easier way of writing it. In particular, I can write this thing here as uh, delta 3 times 2. There's three pairs of delta functions here. C dot lambda tilde. And I can write this triplet of delta functions as delta 2 by 3 of lambda dot C perp. And I can write that thing as delta uh, 3 times 4 of c dot eta tilde, where c, 
I guess I could just call it C0, is a very simple matrix. It has, uh, in column one, it's, in, and column two and column four, it's the identity. So that matrix. So notice that if you dot this matrix into the lambda tilde matrix, you, you get the first equation is that lambda tilde of one is zero, the second equation is lambda tilde two is zero, and the fourth, the last equation is that lambda tilde four is zero. The orthogonal complement has the identity in columns three, four, five, and six, and so this is included there. So this is an instance of that general on-shell function business that we talked about last time. And now we see that this recursion actually gives us a pretty nice representation pretty quickly. So how does this work? Well, again, every time we, we start at this bottom and we walk our way up. So we have one, zero, zero. zero this is our starting point. Zero, 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 zero. I'm just writing the matrix I wrote in the corner there. A little bit bigger. One, zero, 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 zero. Where this is column one, this is column two, this is column three. Okay, this is our starting point. And every time we add a bridge, let's say between legs four and six, we shift column six by some parameter times column four, okay? So this is our starting point. We start with this matrix, and now I shift column six by alpha one, this is our parameter, alpha one times column four. So column four is zero, zero, one. C six transforms into zero, zero, alpha one. Um, okay, and now we shift column four by column two. So column four is this thing, column two is this thing. I'm gonna add alpha two times this. So this becomes alpha two. And then I shift column five by column four times alpha three. So this becomes alpha two, alpha three, and this becomes alpha three. Okay. Um, then I shift column two by column one, alpha four by alpha four times column one. Then I shift four by two. And this, just in the interest of not erasing things and expanding things, I'm going to introduce one little compact, compactifying bit of notation. If I write multiple indices down here, I just mean alpha i plus a sum, a, a sum, not a consecutive sum. A se sequence of indices is just a sum over those alphas. Uh, what did I say, alpha k. So, in particular, so what, where are we at here? We're at column, we're shifting column four by column, by alpha five times column two. So this becomes alpha four, alpha five, and this becomes alpha two plus alpha five. So I'm gonna write it two, five. See, I didn't wanna write a plus sign. It starts getting bigger. Now I shift column two by alpha three times column one. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Did I skip over a step here? One. Four, five. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, this is six. I, by alpha six times column one. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I just skipped over a number. And this is seven, this is eight. Then I shift column three by column two times alpha seven. So this is alpha four comma six times alpha seven. This is just alpha seven. And then I add alpha eight times column one to column two, and we're done. Okay, and what is the function in question? We go back to our, um, to our lecture last time, and what, it's basically the same formula all the time. But F8, the one that we care about here, the one that we're interested in finding a representation of, ugh, I just need a little blank patch. So F8 is now equal to D alpha one over alpha one, D alpha eight over alpha eight, 
times delta 3 by 4 c dot eta tilde, delta 3 by 2 c dot lambda tilde, and delta 2 by 3 of lambda dot c per. Now this might not look very explicit to you, but let's look at it. There are eight internal degrees of freedom here, and there are um, 12, 3 times 2 plus 2 times 3, there are 12 bosonic delta functions, of which four of them are momentum conservation. So for momentum conserving lambdas, you have eight delta functions available, you have eight integration variables. This is a trivial integral, it is just a rational, it results in a rational answer. So I encourage you to put this in Mathematica, um, put this parameterization, this 3 by 6 matrix here, pick some lambdas and lambda tildes that obey momentum conservation, and uh, solve these equations. When you solve the equations, the, the answer is just alpha evaluated on the solution. So it becomes alpha star, 1 over alpha star times 1 over alpha star 2, you know. It's just the solution to these, these delta functions with a Jacobian from the del del solving the delta functions. So this converts it into an explicit formula of spinners and, uh, and, and uh, eta tildes. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm not going to use this, although it's possible to use this very efficiently, and this is unquestionably the state of the art, the reason why I'm not going to use this on Friday is because of this solution problem. You need to, actually there are two reasons, and they're, they have related solutions. The first is that it's not, we're not, not exactly done yet. In order for you to get an actual rational function of the kinematics, you need to solve these delta functions. Now it turns out you can systematically solve them very quickly, so it's not that big of a deal, but that requires a lot more than one lecture, one hour of coding in front of you. The other thing, which is a more severe and more interesting and more subtle kind of thing, it's related to the first problem um, somewhat, is that when you solve these delta functions, you need to pick an ordering of the variables. Similarly, this thing is, if you transpose these, these, uh, these variables, they're really wedge products. It's an oriented volume form, which is related to what I said yesterday is, is that there's kind of a sign ambiguity on these functions. And so this, this, uh, although you can generate a volume form, a particular representative matrix, C, by this particular bridge construction, you can generate another one by, say, starting at leg two instead of leg one, or doing some other transposition sequence you'd like. And all of those things are perfectly adequate up to signs. And up to signs is sometimes bad. Because if you need to add up 175 terms or 10,000 terms or something like this, if you have sign ambiguities on every term, good luck, right? And there is a completely robust moral answer to this story, which is how to, if you have two terms in the recursion relations, how to compare their volumes, how to fix the signs between them. But that's a whole other kind of series of lectures. And for better, well, unfortunately, it's not in the archive version. So it's not in this. Uh, 12, 12, 56, 05, it's in the book. Um, that made it into the book, but it, we haven't updated the archive. Um, so there is an answer to this volume thing. But anyway, both of those things can be completely avoided if we just use momentum twister variables. So on Friday, we're going to, I'm going to briefly introduce momentum twister variables, but I do not expect you to be familiar with them. And in fact, it might be better and more in the spirit of Friday if you don't know much about them at all, or if you at least forget that you knew anything about them. Because the, the, the philo philosophical starting point on Friday is that you have an equation in a paper and you would just like to uh, you know, code it up. You don't really understand it yet, but you just like to, to, to get it working on your computer and verify that you understand it correctly. So internal consistency is where we're going. And you know, imagine it like, a, like a, a, uh, your advisor gives, tells you to go read this paper and make sense of it or something like that. And it's kind of just fresh you know, pri uh, tabula rasa just figure out what to do. And so if you don't know what, where momentum twisters are coming from, it might be a little better for it, for that point of the, the philosophy. Um, but the, the reason why we're using momentum twisters in, for Friday is that we can actually trivially solve all these equations. Um, and we don't, we also get these representations involving some, some C matrix and whatnot, but, um, but the kinematic side of this story is a lot easier to work with. So we're just going to, 
not do diagrammatics, but we're just going to recurse directly. Now, I think I'm over time, um, so I won't tell you much about loop recursion, at least today, but um, I'm happy to answer questions later. So thank you. So that just comes from, oh, I should have, um, it's the same kind of recursion. So the permutation for this amplitude is pretty trivial. One, well, I'll just say it. If this is like one, two, three, one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to one. And if this is one, two, three, one goes to three, two goes to one, and three goes to two. So you just put that in, and then you just feed in this recursion. So when you bridge two things together, you just take the outflow of one leg and you map it into the inflow of the other, you know, so you just take the image coming out of the middle leg and put it into the other one. Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I, and I, I, I oscillate, uh, I, my intuition about this oscillates a bit. Um, sometimes it seems like um, there are preferred, so let me start with the pessimistic side. So the pessimistic side is that, is that there isn't one formula to write down. There's a million different formulas. So at eight particles, there's 2,624 different formulas. Uh, I don't know why any one of them would be preferred. So it doesn't feel like there's like a, an intrinsic you know, one. Uh, but on the other hand, there are kind of preferentially nice ones that do special things. And uh, some of these things, so for example, Lauren Williams and, uh, and her collaborators have, have uh, enumerated very specific solutions to the recursion relations that have very beautiful properties. And, and indeed, and actually in, in those papers, they do have a closed formula for which permutations come out of the recursion. But it's a particular solution, not the general one. I mean, not, there isn't a, a general solution. Um, yeah. But, if thinking about this as a combinatorist, you can definitely discover patterns like that and just write a closed formula directly. Yeah? So, uh, unless you talk about tomorrow, can you maybe briefly sketch what the computations that do that do this? Yeah, so, um, so just more or less in the interest of just uniformity, I didn't talk about loops here. Um, also, because I would have had to talk about non reduced diagrams, which I didn't want to do. Um, the non-reduced diagrams are diagrams for which D, the D that we defined in the last lecture, is not equal to the dimension of the volume form. So the volume form has D parameters in it. And you ask, is that a redundant? Is that a, is that a degenerate volume form or not? And anyway, the loop recursion gives you tons and tons of things that are very, very much non-reduced. So. Um, which is kind of necessary. So if you look at like the four particle amplitude. G24, cross modulating four planes of two dimensions, is, is just that one diagram. It's got four internal degrees of freedom, but you need infinite internal degrees of freedom to write the infinite loop amplitude. So the, basically the same argument about getting this part of the picture for these poles, you know that at loop level, the only other poles that you get in a Feynman expansion are from all Feynman propagators can be divided into two categories, ones which break the diagram in half, those are factorizations. And ones which do not break the diagram in half. Those we can call forward limits. Um, so, so you have a you have a lower loop diagram, L minus one, N plus two. You have two extra legs, you have one lower loop. Um, and uh, and so these are so so in general you have bridges and you have what are called forward limits forward limits of a higher point, n plus 2. I shouldn't write L there. I should write 
It's that's actually k plus one, l minus one. So because bridging things lowers k by one, l minus one. So you get lower loop things here. And you know the going from the recursion relations to like having integrands on hand. Uh, was a very well, important night in my life, so it worked very well. This, this picture works, can be implemented very quickly. Um, but th the form that you get out of this thing, out of this, involves propagators which are bad. You know, and bad, I mean bad in a way that technology doesn't really access. So for example, if you look at Starting at six particles, you, this thing will involve, so what I mean by bad is that, it, is that it has, as a rational function, it matches the sum of Feynman diagrams that you would get. It matches the loop integrand in a very concrete sense. But, um, but it's represented in terms of individual pieces that have spurious poles. And the kinds of spurious poles you have, the first kinds that you see are things like this, L minus P star squared in the denominator where P star is just some complex, it's not, this is not a propagator pole of any Feynman diagram. It's just some offset propagator. That is not a bad spurious pole. It doesn't obstruct anything technologically. You can just feed it into everything. Everything works fine. Where things start getting really bad is that at six points and beyond, you get spurious things down here that are like L to the fourth plus L squared, some, some general fourth degree polynomial. You go to eight particles, you get six degree polynomials in L. Okay, these are not inverse propagators. These are giant they're polynomials in inverse propagators in the denominator. And Feynman's trick does not tell us how to integrate those. So it's a good rational function, but we don't know exactly how to do those integrals. And that's even setting aside the bigger problem, which is that the integrals aren't strictly well-defined. They need to be regularized. So I don't know how to regularize them in a way that's consistent with this. And even if I did, I don't know how to do these integrals because we have you know, fourth degree polynomials in L in the denominator, some mess like that. Um, so at the moment, uh, you know, until somebody comes with a breakthrough idea for how to do these things, and there are reasons to believe that somebody could have a breakthrough like that. Um, uh, Oh, I should say that the contour of integration here is very clear. This uh, is, you call it i, this thing has a parameter alpha, and it's just d alpha, d three lips um, i. So it's, a, it's about as simple as you could possibly get is the loop integrand. This is equal to d four l. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, but anyway, the, until anybody, until, until somebody figures out how to regularize and integrate these things in any concrete way, the best what we have, we, the, the best use that the recursion relations have given us is that as a check on the right answer. So even from the very beginning, the paper where we discovered these all loop recursion relations, we wrote also a closed formula for the MHV amplitudes at all multiplicity. And what we had, and we, we said that we checked it to 22 points, which we did. We guessed a formula, we checked it. Um, and that, has been successful now at two loops and three loops, but, uh, um, but the, the, the output of recursion hasn't been so um, directly useful yet. But one of you might be able to discover how to use it. Okay, I missed the uh, yeah. questions, I guess, time to take a break. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry to delay anymore, but, but uh, one quick thing. In a, in a couple hours or soon, probably this morning, you will get uh, an email from the organizers of a, just a quick little primer for Friday. So just some basic facts that are useful to look over, if you'd like, for the tree amplitudes in Twister space. So.